I'm here at Click Connect 2024 in Orlando and I had the amazing opportunity to catch up with Greg Robertson. Greg is the former program director for the James Webb Space Telescope at NASA. Greg, great to see you. Thank you so much for making time to catch up with me and welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. What an amazing uh, event and uh, uh, I'm, for our audience who wasn't here, I'm going to let them know you had a very long standing ovation after your presentation today. You had a great line where you talked about the fact that the room was just full of geeks, so you were going to get along just fine. Yes, absolutely. Well, so uh, most of my career, I've been around geeks. Yep. Uh, my wife calls me one too, so I, <laughs> so I was in good company. Yes. We had that in common, at least. That, uh, um, now. Your role overall is, it seems very obvious, but uh, in the context of what you've, you've done with, it, with regard to the James Webb Space Telescope, I wonder if you could just give us a very brief sort of outline of the, the unique elements within your role that you've had with regard to that project. Uh, it seems really obvious when you think of the, the job title that, that there's nothing obvious about it, is there? Like, what are some of the really unique aspects that you had to bring into that and, 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 and I guess, you know, with regard to the project you delivered? So when I took over, Webb was in uh, a lot of trouble, uh, way behind schedule, right. way over budget, a lot of uh, technical challenges. Uh, so my overall role was to get it over the goal line, get it, right. get it to launch and, and make sure it works. Um, Starting off, I had to rebaseline the whole program. Okay. So I had to manage down, but I had some pretty good managers. And the engineering team was out of this world, one of the best right, I could work right. with. So I had no concerns with smarts and technical capability. It was really managing the team to get everybody to focus on the same, same objectives uh, and getting it done, getting it done right, getting it done timely. Yeah, Time yeah. is money, right? Uh, in addition to that, I had to manage up. Through my boss, through the NASA administrator, uh, Office of Management and Budget at the White House and Congress. That's where the money comes from. Yes. Uh, so when I re baseline, I had to go to the White House and beg, and Congress and beg for $800 million. That's a big number. <laughs> uh, they thought Webb was important enough, and they showed enough confidence in me uh, to re baseline the program. Uh, a lot of my effort was spent working, trying to adjust the culture. Right. And to, Go fast, but don't rush. Okay. Not every issue is a science project, so to say. Uh, some things that fail, you know, capacitor parts per million, parts per billion, change the capacitor and keep going. You don't need to do a study on the capacitor. So things like that uh, were part of that job. So it was managing down, yeah. across, and up. And of course, we had two uh, major international partners, uh, the Canadian Space Agency, the European Space Agency. Indeed. And so a lot of time uh, working with, with those two agencies as well. Well, that in itself, would, you know, I, I'm not going to claim to be uh, anywhere near your caliber, but I spent a very short period of my time doing project management and a little in program direction in data center space and, and also, I guess, the general IT world when VoIP came in and other things. Uh, and one of the things that you just mentioned there was, was in my microcosm a challenge of cross boundaries of you know the data center team yep. from our organization, third party providers and, and solution providers and so forth. So I can only imagine what it's like at the scale where you've got NASA, as it were, in your world, and all of those engineering challenges, but also other regional, not even just other countries, entire regions like Europe and so forth, yep. having to synchronize you know, resourcing, planning, budgeting, time, and having a fixed timeline. You know, there is no plan B, as they yeah. say. Um, how did you approach that challenge of sort of, you know, bringing some of those larger program director elements, because as you said, not everything's an engineering problem. Uh, I imagine a lot of it was just people skills in many ways that you've had a life experience of bringing people skills to the table and then, and then figuring out how to just, in plain English, get through some of those technical challenges. Yeah. The program schedule didn't look like it's going to work. <laughs> you had to make it happen. It's all about the people. Yep. Uh, on the NASA side, including our whole supply chain. Yep. Uh, on the ESA side and supply chain, the same for the Canadian side. It's working with the partners through the supply chain. And when you have partnerships, global partnerships, you're not sending money. There's no contract. No, no. People are contributing capability and systems. Yep. Uh, so it, it's, um, it's not a big brother, little, little brother. Sometimes we approach it that way. Uh, right. And when you saw the launch and the separation of the rocket from the satellite, you saw the, well, you saw the separation and you saw the solar ray deploy. Before I came on, there was no camera on that rocket. And there was no camera planning right. to be on that rocket. Wow. So that was part of my collaboration yeah, and yeah. negotiation with ESA and, and Ariane Spas, who was their prime contractor for the rocket. And we got it on. Uh, so that was uh, Fantastic. 
a, a real testament to collaborating, yes, not just people, yes. but across borders, because at the end of the day, we're all the same, except for that big ocean, right? Well, yes. Yeah, so uh, that, that was a big part of and it. And as you said, you can't withhold payment for something for, for a late delivery or for change of delivery. Yeah, um, and, and I will say in this business, we're partners because we're after the same thing. Yeah. Again, it's yeah. really everyone focused on the same thing, and that's mission success. Yeah, yeah. And everything else is secondary. Literally changing the world. Yes. yes. Pre-launch, you must have some amazing anecdotes. Uh, I wonder if you could just share one, perhaps, just around some of the challenges you had with regard to data. You know, you've got the volume of data, the size of the data, the speed of it coming in, the shape, the form, et cetera, et cetera. Streaming data, chunks of data, you've got text, video, audio. Are there any fun anecdotes you could sort of share with regard to moments where you're just going, this doesn't look like it's going to work the way we're approaching, how do we then come back to that? Given the nature of the audience yeah. we are, where it's, a, it's a, an entire event full of data geeks. So, so believe it or not, I didn't have any, and I didn't see any challenges with data. Okay. And it was all the time, especially when we were testing, a lot of data. And of course, when we're turning on instruments and things like that, a lot of data flow. The, the challenge I had was not providing data <laughs> to, to my stakeholders, right. but providing them a story based right. on the data. So prior to me taking over, uh, my, my predecessor and some of his team would send data or take data to the stakeholders, and they never knew what they were talking about. Right. They didn't right. have time, they didn't know what it said, and then they'd find something out later. Hey, you're having this problem, we didn't know. So well, we gave right. you the data. Right, right. So, and they didn't so know how to data is appropriate it. for the right people. Yes. So I had to translate that into a story. Right. Here's the problem. Here are the issues. By the way, we have a disposition, and we're gonna we're into that. We're gonna and we're gonna test in two weeks. We we have a little concern here. There's some risk. So if you hear about something, uh, you heard it here first, and I'm update you next month. Right. So um, it was taking that data and turning it into a story, and that's what I call being smart with data. Because at the end of the day, it's for information, right? That's why yes. we use all this yeah, data. Yeah. Yes. Well, that speaks to the very essence of what we're about uh, with regard to here at uh, Click Connect. The annual conference of bringing humans together and having those conversations, seeing each other in, in 3D, not yes. 2D on the yes. Zoom conference, right? <laughs> uh, I was just talking to James Fisher, who's the strategy, chief strategy officer for uh, Click, and he had the same comment. It's like, you know, we're seeing each other in 3D. We're having this real world experience, which is uh, uh, interesting you should say that because that, that is very much the same challenge we face in data across everything not quite so exciting as space, but whether it's you know, business intelligence or analytics generally, or even the approach to AI, is that how do you interpret the data, how you bring some insights and value out of it, and then how do you convey that beyond the basic dashboards, and even now in plain text with Gen AI. Um, I'd love to, with that in mind, I'd love to get your thoughts on sort of the emergence of not just AI, because you've used machine learning and artificial intelligence as a, as a broad term yep. across all space technology, particularly your role and, and in NASA in general, but the generative AI element What's your general sense of kind of the impact of that and, and where it might take us now that we're actually technically talking to the artificial intelligence and it's being trained on the language it's using? That, that surely is going to, to make its way back into your world and space right. technology and NASA as we have less technical people can now talk through technical systems and technical data. And as you said, maybe you don't have to build the dashboards and right. stories anymore. They can ask the question. What's your, what's your general sense of the impact of Gen AI and where that's going to take us, and particularly in the context of your world? Well, number one, I think it's important. And, well, I'll say that's number two. Number one, I've learned so much about AI here at yes. this conference. It's just unbelievable, from click to the partners to the users. Um, I thought I knew a little bit, but I learned a lot here. So, so I wow. think um, going forward, everyone wants to reduce cycle time, yes. increase reliability, or quality, however you want to call it. Um, and all of that saves saves costs. Yes. And and so all of that's time is money. So we need to learn how to do this, our jobs quicker and more efficiently. On the generative part, of course, all of these systems are drawn from large language models and databases, structured, unstructured, uh, and a lot of historical is certainly unstructured. Um, what I look forward to in the future is these systems being able to learn a little bit, increase the knowledge within the system that was not in the database, right? Right, right. So um, I don't know if that's a small leap or a giant leap, and as we make our systems smarter to be more autonomous, whether it's a vehicle, a car, or a space vehicle, uh, and certainly if you have humans, and then doing in situ type missions, uh, let's say on Mars or yeah, some other yeah. place, 
you want the system to be able to use all, a wealth of data that it already has, but also to be able to make those what we call intuitive decisions. Adaptive so changes. The, the adaptive change. So that's what I'm looking forward to. Okay. And, and um, next generation could be next week in this business, right? So. I love that. In many ways, it kind of reminds me as a parent of, of watching our kids learn from their learnings. A absolutely. And you can only give them so much foundationally. I know as a parent yourself, you've been through that experience. Uh, and there was a, a, a great, great example. An interesting moment where a young man uh, asked you an interesting question about your, your, your own kid's response to your role this morning on stage, which, which gave me the sense that the future is bright yes. uh, on so many levels going forward. Um, but no, I think there's two amazing sound bites here. I'm, I'm definitely going to quote you on that first part, which is you've gained a lot of insight to AI uh, by being here. But also, I, I do love that idea that if we can get to the point where our artificial intelligence and the generative piece, as you said, um, to, to paraphrase that, is that it can learn from its learnings, it can yes. bring that adaptive piece, and I guess that's where, as you said, it probably will be a quantum leap to, to, to use a silly phrase, but uh, it seems like a small thing, but that will be quite a, a large advancement, advancement, I think. Yes. I wonder if you could wrap us up with, with one last thought, because I know we've got a fixed amount of time. Um, there are a lot of people who look to, look to you and look up at you. Uh, uh, I mean, we all stood up and gave you a very long standing ovation this morning, and rightfully so. For people looking to you and thinking they might not necessarily work from NASA, but to follow your career path, your journey, what are some of the things that you've gleaned through your life journey and your working experience that you could share with them just to wrap us up as to how they might approach that and, and turn into a mini-me in your form of to, to, you know, some of the things that shaped your direction and how they might approach it, you know, the types of things they might do themselves individually, where they might get mentorship and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. What does that look like so that they can sort of glean yeah. from your experience something that might shape their life and their career? So I certainly appreciate the applause this morning. Um, and well then, by the way. makes me feel good. Um, so I, I, I grew up as a, what I call a, a poor country boy. Okay. And I stress both of those. Uh, growing up in Southern Virginia, predominantly rural, um, working in tobacco fields, et cetera. I didn't see college as an option, number right. one. Uh, okay. Although I loved school and had great teachers. And all along the way, teachers were supportive, they even pushed me a little bit. Yeah. Um, so I had a love for school, but more so love for learning. Yes. Also, I didn't realize at the time, I was honing those skills of dealing with people. The, the, right. They have classes now talking about dealing with difficult people. Yes, I yes. learned that in kindergarten, that's the saying goes, okay. right? <laughs> of course, you hone these skills over, over the years. So certainly at home, I had mentors from my parents, uh, but most of my education, uh, many of my teachers were mentors as well. Okay. Um, and I've, I've mentored many since then uh, myself. And in the workplace, I uh, had lots of mentors. So I always stress, uh, find someone who you respect, uh, you want to emulate, not everything, because you want to bring yourself the good the picture. And just pick their brains from time to time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, somebody you can trust, somebody who can tell you, you know will tell you when, when something is not right as well, because sometimes people just tell you everything you think, they think you want to hear. Uh, and then there's a piece of resiliency. It's hard to teach resiliency or to say what it is, but when times get tough, and they will, and yes. it certainly did for yes. me, just find a way to just keep pushing along, keep pushing along, and a better day will come, and, and then the rest is history, as they say. I, I love that. It's that coping mechanism of getting through adversity absolutely. that in many ways should make you stronger. Oh, absolutely, it will. <laughs> well, Greg, uh, th there's some pretty inspiring uh, uh, one-liners just in that line, but thank you so much for making time to catch up with me. It's been great to have you on the show. I hope we can have you back sometime in the future, but in the meantime, safe travels. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, providing so much inspiration for everybody here at the event. And, and again, at the risk of sounding sycophantic, the, the standing ovation today was, was so heartfelt for all of us that uh, when we look up, uh, the only thing I won't forgive you for, if it were, is that you changed my entire view of the universe in so many ways because you found things out there that we shouldn't have found and now we're going to change our math. Uh, so that just generates a lot of homework I've now got to go and do to re-understand what's beyond the universe. But that's what we explore, right? Exactly. I know. So you yes. did everything you set out to do, but it turned my world inside out. Yes, absolutely. Um, Greg, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. And again, uh, safe travels. And uh, we'll look forward to watching your future and your career path uh, in this thank astronomical you. sense. Thank and you so much. Thanks yes. for your time. Yes, Cheers. Absolutely. Absolutely.